The Human Service Organization Bronx Works has been helping individuals and families improve their economic and social well-being for decades now. It's seen residents in the borough through some pretty challenging times, including the dark days of the 1970s and 80s when parts of the Bronx were literally burning. Well, now Bronx Works is helping residents, everyone from toddlers to seniors, get through the unprecedented challenges of the coronavirus. And my name is George Bodarki. I'm the news director of WFUV. We're an NPR affiliate station based in the Bronx. I'm with you as part of a collaboration we have with BronxNet called Bronx Connections. And with me is the executive director of Bronx Works, Eileen Torres. Eileen, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me. Well, thank you for having me. So what are you up against as an organization right now in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic? Um, so, so, um, we, we, like everyone else, um, have, um, had to pivot our services, um, and rethink, rethink, um, where our employees work, right? Um, whether, you know, who works remotely, who has to come in. Um, and so, um, once the governor issued his executive order, we quickly, um, reviewed with the help of our general counsel and assistant counsel, um, which programs were considered essential programs and had to remain open. Some of them were very obvious. We knew that our shelters for homeless families and our shelters for homeless um, adults would have to remain open. Um, some others, um, which we weren't expecting, we weren't expecting our senior centers to have to continue to operate. So, um, but knowing full well, well that we, we of course want to help seniors obtain the food that they need. Um, so we, there was a quick pivot of services there as well. So we had to modify things quickly. Um, and our food pantries are still operating. Um, we become res resourceful and very creative in trying to maintain um, the social distancing for some of these programs, right? Yeah, so exactly what are you doing to make sure people who are relying on emergency food services get that food in this era of social distancing? So um, we typically, for let me use the food pantry as an example. Um, so we operate a food pantry that's um, at our 1130 Grand Concourse location um, right next door to Bronx Housing Court. And it's open on Saturday, so um, that's very attractive to working families who may not be able to stand in line during the week. So we get a large number of families, about 150 people that usually come in, and it's a client choice pantry, which means that people are usually able to shop for their items. So we have grains, we have fresh produce, um, and people can come along and pick the items that they like. Uh, instead of getting a bag of food that's pre pre-bagged pre for them, and then they get home, they don't really like the items that are in there, and it goes to waste. Um, so they can't really do that right now. Um, so one thing that we did was we came up with a menu of items that we handed out to people. We also made sure the night before our staff went and put down painters, boot painters tape on the sidewalk for the um, line that would form to make sure people were six feet apart. We're out there explaining what that blue tape was for, um, reminding people. We put up signs everywhere, reminding people about the social dis distancing. Um, our staff were all provided with masks, gloves, hand sanitizers, um, Clorox wipes, right? Um, and then once a person filled out the menu items that they wanted, we actually shopped for them. So we went and we collected the items ourselves, we bagged it, and we handed it to them. Um, and that's one way that we were able to change our service there. You mentioned that you're also continuing your homeless services. So that's how right. are you assisting people who do not have a home at a time when people are saying to stay at home? That's right. Um, so our shelters for homeless families, um, people have their own units. Um, so, um, so it's not like this for the families, at least it's not this large room where everybody sleeps. Right. Um, so they have their own units. And so people are encouraged to stay in those units. Um, what we have found challenging is that within those families are students, right? Students who attend public school. Um, or charter schools. And so now everyone's moved to this remote learning for the students. Um, and that's become a real challenge for our, our homeless students. Um, our buildings are not wired. Um, so there's no internet for the entire building. Um, and there isn't a Wi-Fi service. So um, DOE was very good about handing out uh, laptops to the students, 
Some of them have hot spots, some of them don't. Um, and even for some of the hot spots, they're not working in the building. Um, and so we're quickly scrambling about trying to figure out a way to wire our building and have been engaged in very long, extensive conversations with people from, you know, the, some of the cable service providers to really see if we can do that and do that quickly. Because by now, students have been missing, you know, a couple of weeks of school, mm -hmm. if you really, really think about it. So that's a real challenge that we're facing. Yeah. As we know, New York City kids like to get out. They like to play with their friends. Right now, playgrounds are now closed. You know, that's right. basketball games off limits at this point. Yes. How right. are you helping youth or what's your that's advice right. to youth out there right now? Um, so one of the things we've done, we've, again, you know, everyone has to come up with very creative ways and very resourceful ways to make sure that, um, the students are also having fun. Um, and so um, our after school program um, providers have, staff have um, actually been coming up with games that students can use. Um, so that's one of the things that we've been doing and DYCD, Department of Youth and Community Development that funds some of these programs for us um, has been encouraging us to do that, right? So there's been a lot of checks that we've been having calling the students to find out and the families to find out um, how things are going with not just a remote learning, but how things are going in the home. How are people keeping um, occupied? Um, and so we're also looking to try to see if we can come up with a web-based um, game that we can play with some of the students as well to keep them entertained. You also reference seniors and making sure seniors are taken care of in your centers. What can you tell us about the efforts there to make sure seniors get what they need, that they're being cared for well? So with our senior centers, um, we had to quickly move to a model of providing grab and go meals. Um, you know, the thing that really is, um, is difficult for us is that the centers are based on this whole concept of congregate, congregate meals and socialization for the seniors, right? Um, and so we have to move away from that. Um, so we quickly did the uh, grab and go meals for the seniors, again, trying to practice social distancing, um, giving people appointments uh, for when they can come in. Um, but seniors typically like to get there very early. Uh, so that's been quite a challenge for us. Um, and now uh, Department for the Aging, which funds our senior centers, has moved to a different model, um, which is they will actually do the meals themselves, um, as opposed to, and, and the, you know, the meals are dropped off at our senior centers, and then they have a, a delivery service pick them up and drive them to the seniors' homes. Um, but what we have encountered is that there are a number of seniors who are not connected to our senior centers who are looking for food. Um, and then we also have um, families that are connected to some of the housing developments where we may provide services, but not necessarily food services like after school programs or workforce development who are reaching out to us to say, we do not have food in our home. And so that is something else that we've been able to quickly um, come up with is uh, partner with other groups, get some food, um, and then have a driver that we weren't expecting to have a driver, but you know, come up with a staff person who actually can drive to these developments, drop off emergency pantry bags for them, and do the same with some of these seniors that are not connected to the senior centers. It sounds, I, it sounds like, Eileen, that you are learning some things along the way and you might walk away from this with some new processes and things in place should you need to employ them, hopefully not, in your yes. head. Yes. Um, so certainly we, we've, um, we've learned a lot of new things. <laughs> um, we learned how expensive it is to, to do deep cleaning. That's one of the things we've learned. <laughs> um, but uh, yes, so we, I think typically what we normally see at the organization, um, what's the highest need is usually um, our eviction prevention services, right? Usually people are coming to our doors looking for us to help them pay their rental arrears. Mm. Um, and right now there's a moratorium on the eviction. So I think people don't have a worry for that, but um, um, 
people what what people really need right now are um, assistance with food, right? Food purchasing because one, people have lost their jobs, so they're not able to buy food any longer. Um, and two, some people are going to supermarkets and there's nothing left on the shelves. Um, so even if they can get to the supermarket and purchase something, there isn't something there that they can get. Um, and so there is this need that we think we're quickly learning how to navigate that and how to um, become more of a food service provider during this crisis. And if people want more information or need to contact you, people watching right now, how can they go about doing that? So, um, so we've set up an emergency fund um, and people can go on to our website, www.bronxworks.org. Um, and they can go onto the website. Um, there's a link to the emergency fund. Um, if they'd like to donate um, financially, no, no donations too small. Um, and then um, if people want to donate any particular items, um, well, there's, um, you know, we have young students who are asking for earbuds because now that everyone is squeezed into the home and their siblings are all trying to do remote learning, it's a very noisy household. Um, and so they don't have that necessarily. So, um, so people who are wishing to donate that, that would be great. Um, there's also a need for Pampers. Um, and so if people are willing to donate some Pampers, you know, they can go onto a website and see the various locations that they can go to either drop things off or um, go on to our, we created an Amazon wish list. They can go onto Amazon and, and look for the others themselves, so. Eileen Torres is the executive director of Bronx Works. Thank you, thank you so much for the work that you do. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.